in the house of the Lord. Can I get an amen? amen? I don't normally do that, but I'm kind of hyper right now. I ha not, uh, this is what I tell our team all the time, that I have a special coffee I only drink on Sundays that's like double, triple caffeinated. So I'm usually, you know, half with the Holy Spirit and half on caffeine on Sundays that, um, you know, some days are good. This is a good one. So we're so glad you're here with us today. My name's Caleb Herring. I'm the lead pastor. We have a couple different things going on in our service. We have uh, a couple send-offs. There's some people that are going to be going across the country that we're going to be sending off and, and blessing and praying over. Then there's going to be a group that's going across on, into a whole nother continent uh, that we're going to send off and pray and bless, and it's going to be fun. Uh, just so you know, uh, services uh, that, that's coming up that I want you to be r reminded of is September 11th is going to be a pastor open house. Hey, Eric, good to see you. Um, Eric and I play basketball together, and it's a surprise. Thanks for coming today. Uh, we're going to be uh, having an open house where it's a pig out. I'm actually going to cook a pig with some friends in the ground. I'm going to invite you to eat it with me. No one's going to get sick. It's going to be great. Uh, from 4 to 8, I hope you enjoy coming over and just celebrating God providing for our family because you've been part of that with us. Um, also, uh, I want to bring up John Bartlett to, and Ann Bartlett. To, can we appreciate John and Ann? They're going to share a little bit about um, what's called Bible quizzing. Uh, and so uh, listen in and they'll describe kind of what that is. One of the things that uh, Ann and I have done in every church we've been a part of since we've gotten married is uh, uh, lead a Bible quizzing program. And these days we serve as the regional director for sort of West Coast Bible quizzing in the Free Methodist Church. So we get to oversee a lot of different uh, Bible quizzing things. And we'd love to get some Bible quizzing going here. Now, right after this announcement, I'm going to go into the uh, kids' class and we're going to be doing a demonstration and some stuff in there. And so we're going to keep the announcement here kind of short, but I wanted to make an announcement to the adults in the church about Bible quizzing because to have a successful program, it's got a lot of moving parts. There's coaches, there's quiz masters, there's, there's a, you know, we need support from parents, but we need support even from adults maybe who aren't parents. Uh, but if there is anybody who, as an adult, hears sort of the goal of Bible quizzing, which is to have young people hide God's word in their heart. Okay? If you think that's a value and you're looking for a place to support or serve or give a little bit of time, you don't have to be a parent of a kid that's involved. You don't have to know what's going on. That's Ann and I's job. We teach you how to, how to help and make it work. But uh, you can be, you know, a 20-something or an 80-something, and we can, we can find a way to, to, to make, make it work for you to help support Bible quizzing. Uh, in our old uh, church, uh, there was a, a lady friend of ours named Shirley who, she just came and she listened to our son Joe quote his verses every week, and that was all she did. Mm -hmm. And it was a super blessing to her, and it was a super blessing to him. So we can, we can find ways uh, to make it work. So that's the goal. The goal is for, for young people to hide God's word in their heart and to have that pay off throughout the rest of their life. And it's a program open for anybody from 4th to 12th grade. So uh, one of the things that we were thinking of doing is saying, if you're in middle school or older than the kids' class that usually meets there, come on in and watch what we're doing. But now I found out that some of the middle schoolers who are coming back from camp have to stay here and, and do an announcement and some things like that. But uh, after you're done with your announcement, come on back. Come on in, watch what we're doing. Or after church, uh, come see what we're doing. If uh, memorizing God's Word and then having once-a-week practice and uh, once a month, a competition on it sounds fun to you, uh, come check it out. We've got some flyers. Uh, if there's interest, we'll have a more full-blown meeting someday to explain the whole thing. So did I miss anything? Okay. Great. Good. Can Thanks. we appreciate these guys? Thank you. And hiding God's word, God's word in your heart is not just a young person's job. It is an adult person's job. We're to meditate on his word day and night not till we're in 12th, not until we're 12th grade, but beyond, right? So would you stand with me as we begin um, our time of worship? Allie, who's uh, from YWAM, who's going to be part of the team that we pray over and bless, is going to lead us in worship music. But let me open our time together with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to, to come and gather under your roof, God. 
that you're the type of God who can gather multiple nations, multiple languages, multiple backgrounds under one roof for one purpose, God, because of your son, Jesus. And we thank you that you have the power to do something like that. And today we get to send some people off doing the thing that you called us to do, to go. And sometimes we think it's, you know, remind us today, going can be something we do on a daily basis, wherever we're sent. Thank you for entering into our life, entering into the, our room, our hearts, in a way that's changed us, God. We want to do that for others as well. So, Father, help us to, to worship and praise you and know you more through, through word, through deed, through song, through conversation um, in this hour and this time together. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Spring. 
Send the darkness running out of an empty 
us going halfway around the world or across the states, but it can happen right here, right now. Um, Father, would you fill us with your Holy Spirit, and would you just lead us this morning? Would you lead us this weekend, this next week? Um, yeah, thank you, Holy Spirit, for the work that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I'm going to invite uh, our teens that went to the camp uh, Christian, if you'd like to come forward, and Austin, if you feel up for it, I'd love for you to join us. But we had a few teens and uh, a youth leader, our intern for the summer, Jacob, go to camp recently, um, and I just wanted to have uh, them share a little bit about their time there. Jacob was unable to make it today just due to some transportation issues, but we want to celebrate what happened, what God did. So um, would you mind just sharing with uh, our church family your name, a little bit about um, the school you're going into, and tell us about camp. Hi, I'm Christian, and I'm going into Youth Girls Middle School. Camp was an awesome experience. I met a bunch of amazing people and had a lot of fun. Put that up a little. Oh, yeah. sorry. No, this slide. <laughs> um, one of my favorite parts of camp was how many kind, genuine people they were. Yeah, thanks. We appreciate Christian here. Thank you. And uh, I, I mentioned last week, uh, Christian and Austin are siblings. They're actually twins. Um, Austin was baptized last uh, a couple weeks ago at camp, and Christian's uh, you know interested in looking to that moment for his own journey in faith. So God is moving in the young people within the body of faith here, and I'm just thankful that you are part of that story with them. You know, whether it's, um, you know, through the youth ministry or maybe it's through ministries that you serve here, you know, your giving of tithes and offerings so that we can have a place to share the good news of Christ with people like Jacob and, or Jacob Christian and Austin. Um, I'm going to invite Terry Folsom forward and she's going to share uh, the scripture we have today. So Terry. I'm going to be reading Luke chapter 14, verses 1 and 7 through 11. On one occasion when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you were invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who has invited both of you may come to you and say, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Thank you, Terry. Yeah, we can appreciate Terry. We're going to talk about a little bit today. Getting in front of people and talking is very scary. You know, I do it every week, but you have to pay me. I just heard some beeping up here. Um, I did, uh, you know, double check batteries and make sure everything was working. So I'm very thankful for our tech team in the back. Um, yes. 
if you want to be part of the team that helps transit, you know, the, the service goes trans smoothly and be part of, you know, slides and pushing buttons, and we'd love to talk with you and get you trained. We had three new people getting trained this last week on the sound and how things work. So we're improving each week as we bring new people on board. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Father's Day I had with some friends of ours. We were getting out of the car and unpacking everything, and it was a beautiful day. You know, it was the sun was out, and so, of course, my guns were out. My sleeves, I had the cut-off sleeves. Uh, me and my friends, Zach and Luke, went to Willamette Valley Pie and got a free slice of pie because on Father's Day, they give you free, you know, slices of pie. Um, Mary and Barry Crunch for me, although I heard that they're discontinuing that pie. Rest in peace. And we, as we're unpacking um, everything and getting ready to go golfing, uh, we are, you know, making sure we have everything we need, you know, golf clubs, which I had to borrow because I go golfing once every other year. But I'm with my friends, and we're going to have some fun. You know, it's not about just being good at golf. It's about enjoying and, and having some relationship and having some time that's fun together. Uh, I made sure to get extra balls because I know I'd rather be ha having fun with my friends than looking for the ball that I hit, you know, where off ever it goes. Uh, but when we get into the office, they looked at me, the person behind the desk, and says, you can't play. I was like, what? We have our golf balls. We have the golf clubs. We're here. There's not even anybody on the course. Uh, we don't understand why there wasn't anybody on the course because it's Father's Day. Why wouldn't a bunch of guys be out there golfing? But it, was, it wasn't like, a, you know, there's too many people on the course. And we made sure, you know, there wasn't any need to reserve space. But she saw that I wasn't wearing sleeves and said, you can't play here without sleeves. I was like, oh. Well, I don't know if you know this about golf culture. Some golf courses require a wardrobe. Maybe you've been golfing before, and you realize this. I had it. And she looked at me. He's like, you can't play without sleeves. And I'm looking at my friends. We're, we're like, what are we going to do? Now, this little lady was very sweet and very kind. She says, I have an idea. I'll just go to my house and see what my husband has in his dresser. Maybe you can wear something of his. I was like, whatever it takes. Come on, we'll, we'll, we'll do whatever it takes. So she goes off, and me and my friends, they're all giving me a hard time. I knew you should have wore sleeves. I knew you should have, you know, called ahead and asked about the wardrobe. And I didn't think anything of it. And, you know, we just wanted to have fun. But she comes back and she shows me this double XL T-shirt. That's one of those vacation shirts from Florida that you get, you know, when you're visiting. And, and, I, and I wear it and it goes past my elbows and past, you know, my quads. And I look silly. I'm slightly embarrassed, but we're there to have fun anyway, and we're laughing, and we're having a good time. We end up having a good time. We, we play golf, but this is something we deal with every day. Sometimes we go into rooms, we go into places, and we don't know what to expect. Maybe it's something new, and, and it, maybe it's a country you're going to, and you're not sure how it's going to be, but today we're going to talk about, you know, how do you enter a room, no matter what it is? How do you enter a room, no matter what, and be able to hold your own or at least not be embarrassed, you know, at the, at the low level? How can we go into a room, not get embarrassed, but perhaps maybe we can go into a room and, and maybe even get ahead. Maybe we, we go into a room in, in a way that at the end of the day, it's like, oh, we're actually moving up a ladder. And, and for Westerners, for Americans, this is like, this is why we moved to America if you're from out of the country for a lot of people because they want to be, have a successful life or they want to make it big. A lot of people who are coming to America from other countries see that as the American way, and that's kind of a little bit of our foundation in our history. And so that's, that's an okay thing to feel. And, and today we're going to talk about how Jesus actually gives some really concrete advice about two things, you know, you know avoiding embarrassment and getting ahead. And it's really simple. I love sometimes when Jesus just lays it out and it's simple and it's there for us and we get to enjoy the benefits of his wisdom because Jesus was really good at entering the rooms that he had to when he was walking planet Earth. I mean, just, just think about it. His neighbors, and he would enter the rooms of neighbors and strangers, people he's never met before, and he would enter into rooms of people who were, you know, uh, you would be prostitutes. He'd be able to enter a room and sit at the table and be able to hold conversation and be himself. He'd be able to, to go into a room where there's government workers. Perhaps they don't think and 
feel the same way about politics as he does or the way they manage. Like, and he was able to sit at those tables and can like, be himself. Like, to be able to enter in rooms like that that you're not sure how they're going to be is so important, especially when they're strangers and you're not sure what it's going to be like. For his own friends, I mean, he's able to enter in his room with his own friends, and there's healing, there's miracles, there's great teaching, and it was just fun to be around Jesus when he was in a room. People would crowd around him. You know, in community, you know, think of the synagogue or a temple where many people would gather, or just when he's out walking, you know, whether it was a group that was out to get him or a group that was out to be with him, he was able to navigate all sorts of situations. And, and if we're able to do that and enter into the rooms that, like Jesus did, you know, I think we'd be able to follow a good example. But Jesus does, there's one thing that Jesus does really well that we're going to zoom in today that if we do this well, I think your life could change in dramatically because there's a room in our life that we try to avoid. There's a place in our life and, and maybe your family's life or maybe your own life that you're like, I'd rather not. You know, it's, it's kind of like that person in the grocery store that you don't want to talk to. And instead of going down the same aisle, you kind of go down the other aisle and you avoid them. Have you ever done that? Yeah. Jesus is, is teaching us today, how do you enter into the room of your enemies. Now, not many of us have like, you know, enemies where, man, I'm not sure if they're going to be waiting for me in the parking lot ready to beat me down. Perhaps you do, or perhaps you know someone that is like that. But when I'm thinking about enemies, the rooms where you know there's conflict, like the rooms that are tense when you're in them with certain people. Have you ever been in a room where you can feel the tension? Maybe you're in a room and there's conflict bubbling up. Maybe there's not conflict for a while, but it bubbles up and you kind of feel your body, you know, getting tense. Your fist starts to clench. Your pits start to get a little wet. That happens sometimes for some folks. Where do we, how do we enter into those rooms? Because I think sometimes those rooms are the ones that if we don't know how to navigate, they're the ones that hold us back. They're the ones that the ceiling we can't get past this room. It's got like a low ceiling. And Jesus is going to teach us today. It's like, how do we navigate some of these rooms? Because those are the ones I think probably hold us back the most. And, you know, for example, at work, maybe it's just, you know, a relationship with coworkers. It's just something you can't move on with this coworker. It's never, it's always been the same. How do I move forward where we're mutually being able to respect each other? Or I can at least stand it to be in the same room as him. Maybe it's at school and you've got bullies at school and you don't know how to a act around, you know, in the classroom. Or, or maybe, you know, with school, it doesn't, it doesn't just be in person. It's digital sometimes. Maybe it's online bullying or online work that you just can't get away from them. But maybe Jesus isn't saying you have to get away. Maybe today you hear how do you enter into those rooms where there's bullies and there's people that create tension for you and it's hard. I learned today, my brother was visiting this weekend, and he was telling me about his friends, or not his friends, some bullies in school that were my friends. I had no idea. Uh, it just blew me away. There's people that probably are getting pushed around or treated unfairly that are close to you that you don't even know. But perhaps today you can figure out how do you help those friends that might be experiencing conflict and tension in the school. Or maybe it's at home. It's a place that you're supposed to be safe, but it feels like you're walking on eggshells sometimes when you come home. You don't know how your, your loved ones are acting that day, if it's going to be a good day or a bad day. Like, how do you enter in a room when it feels like you're walking on eggshells? Maybe it's just a relationship. It's not a room. It's not your house. It's just when you're out and about with this friend, and just, it's just hard to, to befriend this person because they always bring up a topic and they always know how to make you feel small and belittled. And it just makes you not want to hang out with them anymore. Maybe, and you're no longer friends with them. You want those relationships to be better. And perhaps today, those relationships, we can take this, move the ceiling up a little higher. We can keep from being embarrassed at least, but also move forward. Maybe we, those relationships have been plateauing. And we can today move forward in those relationships. Let me talk about uh, this uh, one room I was in with uh, 
I was working for an organization called Salem Leadership Foundation before I was a pastor here, and we were part of this program that would serve kids after school with soccer. I love soccer, and go Portland Timbers, uh, right? Uh, PT, FC, PT, FC. That's one of their cheers. If you ever go, you will not be embarrassed. See, I'm helping you today. Um, but we were in this room with these Salem Kaiser School District administrators, and we were trying to provide this after school program that the schools wanted. They said, Hey, we see that this program is serving families and kids and schools really well. We want this in our school. And we're like, Yeah, of course. We've got coaches, we've got this, this curriculum that helps kids want to come to school because they get to be on the soccer team. You know, sometimes. For some people, you need leverage, like something to leverage them to learn. That was me in school. I, w I actually failed some classes in school, then they took, my, took me away off my soccer team. I was like, okay, I'll start showing up to school now. It works. And I graduated, it works. And we were talking with these administrators, and they were seeing this program as an outside program. They're like, okay, well, you're in these 10 schools. That's going to be 10 different fields, and the cost for every field is this much. And we're like, whoa, 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 I don't, what? This is not some outside, you know, business organization. Like, we're, we're just uh, volunteers trying to come help what the school wants. And I could feel in my own body getting tense because this was real personal for me. Have you ever felt like your, your blood, they say your blood boiling. Like, have you ever felt your blood warming up? Sometimes it goes to your face and it gets red. That happens to me a lot sometimes when I'm embarrassed. But in this moment... I was starting to feel this program slip away because to be able to put this obstacle of all the financing involved felt like it was insurmountable. And my tone started to raise. My emotions started to rise. And you could feel the tension in the room. I could feel in my body. Maybe you've had one of those moments. No matter what I was saying or no matter what they were saying, it didn't seem to make sense until my... Executive director, my boss at the time, Sam Skillern, started to talk. And when I saw him talking, I don't even remember what he said. But I just remember my, the tension in the room seemed to calm down. Because he started to, in some way, like, word and be eloquent and share what he was understanding and what he was hearing. And began to see both sides and put it out there plainly. And I don't know what he was saying or how he was saying it, but I was like, He's calming me down the way he's talking. He made everybody feel like they were understood and could hear and see a solution. And my body was beginning to calm down. And at the end of, the, at the end of our meeting, we walk out. And it's like, I feel like we've got somewhere. And I remember looking at Sam. I was like, that's who I want to be like. Someone who can walk in a room even though the tension is thick and the conflict doesn't seem to be able to be resolved and yet find a way to act that has a tone that's of peace, that brings people together, not divide. Oh, man, it was like a gift. And I think some people are naturally gifted with that, but I wanted that. And today, Jesus actually is able to show us that and how we could take steps towards being that kind of person when things are full of tension and conflict. And let me tell you, we're going to experience tension and conflict. Maybe you're feeling that tension right now, like, man, He's kind of going on and on. I wish he'd get going. Or maybe it's something, you're about to meet someone after this and you know it, something's going to bubble up because it always bubbles up. Jesus has a word for you today because he's really good at entering in conflict. He does it. He practices it. He does it all the time. Actually, Luke, who has been investigating the story of Jesus, this is the third time Jesus receives the invitation to go into a home of conflict. In Luke chapter 7, 36 through 50, he's invited by these religious leaders to come into their house. And if you know much about Jesus and his relationship with these people who were in charge of the temple and the synagogue, it wasn't like, you know, buddy-buddy. They weren't besties. They didn't have matching bracelets. They were in conflict all the time. And yet Jesus says, yeah, I'll go to your, ta your house. I'll sit at your table. I'll eat your food. He does it over and over. He's not afraid to enter into these conflicts. And if you're not a believer today, that should be like relieving to you. 
Because for, for non-believers, maybe you're thinking like, man, Jesus can't handle me. I've got so much messy, you know, doubts and, and things that I'm not really happy about God with, or I don't understand, I'm confused, and I'm, and I'm walked away from the church. Maybe that's part of your story as someone you know. It's like, you should be relieved because Jesus here is like, okay, I'll still walk towards you. That, that, that's not a bother to me. Like, you have tension, you have some things against me, that's fine, I'll, I'll listen. Jesus is doing that with these people. And for those that maybe are Christ followers and you have some conflict and tension coming up, man, we've got a precedent. We've got some hope to look for. Hopefully it gives you hope. Like, oh man, I'm about to go into this new culture, this new environment. You know what? Jesus did it three times, you know, and it, he did it, you know, again. He survived the first time. He went the second time. He survived, you know, perhaps I could muster the courage to go into. And hopefully that gives you some hope today. So, Let's, let's begin how, how it starts in the today's passage, Luke 14, 1. This is how it looks. This is how the conflict starts. It says, on one occasion, and you can follow along as E in the back leads us, Luke chapter 14, verse 1. Luke chapter 14, verse 1. It says this, on one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. Do you see the tension already? They're wanting to see if he's going to mess up. And they, in fact, try to trap him a little bit. And they have a little scenario that if you were to read the next couple of verses where Jesus automatically already responds in a way that takes their, you know, tension and begins to, to be able to walk with it. He doesn't mind the hard questions. So he's being watched closely. And we're going to skip down to verse 7. It says this in verse 7. When Jesus noticed, and you can circle that word notice or underline it, that's a special word there we'll come back to, how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go. Sit down at the lowest place so that when your hosts come, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus notices they want to be seen as great. This is that word notice, and it's actually like he was paying attention. It's not just like he glanced and saw. He was watching, you know, how they were watching him closely. It was like, okay, you want to watch me closely? I'll watch you closely. It's a mutual relationship he's given back, and it's one of those paying attention. He, as he's seeing this, he's noticing. It's not just a glance. He's noticing they want to be seen as great. And this is like all human condition, right? We all want to be seen as great. That's why your Facebook timelines have all the best pictures on it, right? The best angles with the best lighting. Maybe it's that best plate of food you cooked and you took a picture because you're proud. You want to be seen as, you know, hey, things are going well here. But, I mean, that's not always the case. That's not our whole life, right? We might say, hey, we're doing fine. Things are great. You know, me and my wife couldn't be, much, couldn't be better. And perhaps that's partly true. Perhaps there isn't any problems at that moment. But if you're like most people or like me, you experience hardship and your marriage isn't always the greatest. Your, your time working on the job isn't always pleasing or great or amazing. Like, and yet Jesus is seeing these people trying to be seen as great. And this is what he wants them to know. Or this is what he tries to get. It's almost like he's giving them advice. You want to be seen as great? Okay. Let me help you with that. I want you to keep from being embarrassed. If you want to be great, you can't be humiliated. Okay? So it's almost like a little advice he's giving them practically. And this is what we're going to be taking away. He says, okay, keeping from being embarrassed, and this is how you get ahead. Are you ready? He says this. Take off the rose-colored glasses. 
Take off the rose-colored glasses. What does that mean? It means, you know, if you see through rose-colored glasses, you see everything as they aren't. You see everything in a way that's beautiful or gray, because rose color, it's a beautiful color. It's, you know, uh, I think um, Andre 3000 has a great lyric in one, of his, in one of his songs. You put your pants on one leg at a time, like everybody else. This is what Jesus saying. It's like, you're not as important as you think. There's someone that's probably better than you, smarter than you, better looking than you, maybe a better athlete than you, a better fill in the blank. Like, you can't be thinking you're the most important person in the room. My dad taught me this. He was a, he's an executive director at this company in Austin, Texas, and he tells me all the time, he's like, yeah, I'm not the smartest person in the room. I was like, oh, you aren't? Like, why are you the leader? You know, that's what I thought. It's kind of my immaturity. Why are you the one in charge? Like, no, no, no. You can have lawyers and attorneys at your table, and you know you're not going to be smarter than these guys who've went to school for 12 years. As leaders, you've got to be able to bring people who are smart and maybe who aren't smart together for a mission, like aligning them with the mission and vision. That's what a good leader does. There's always someone better than you. And Jesus is trying to teach us, like, hey, you've got to take the rose-colored glasses off and see things as they really are. The world doesn't revolve around you. The world doesn't revolve around. Take the rose-colored glasses off, and this wasn't new. This is not the first time. You've probably heard this. This is not, you know, uh, something that you've never heard before. And the same was for, true for Jesus. Jesus was a good Jewish uh, boy. He learned his Hebrew Bible. You know the Hebrew Bible? It's the first, you know, 30-something books in your Bible. It's the ones that many people kind of avoid and ignore because it's kind of confusing because we don't live as Israelites or Jews did. But Jesus knew his Bible. He knew that in Proverbs, this is what I think, at least I think he does because I'm sure he was a good student. He sat in the front row. Props to these three in the front row. Proverbs 25, 6 through 7. This is what it says. This was long before Jesus walked planet Earth. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great. It keeps going. This seems very similar to what we just listened to. For it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. Does this sound a little similar to the parable Jesus told? Can you make an educated guess that perhaps Jesus would have known about this when he was seeing and noticing I imagine he did. I imagine Jesus knew his Hebrew Bible, and he's like, I've read this before. I'm going to talk about this to these guys. And even if you're not, you know, a Bible scholar, this is something business leaders know. Maybe you've read the book um, Stephen Covey wrote, Good to Great. He studied all these businesses and what made them so great over a long period of time, and he looked at the leaders of these organizations that what made them so great over a long period of time, because there was a lot of different organizations that when a big circumstance hit, maybe it was a recession, maybe it was a, a, a buyout, where their organization would just plummet, like some circumstance changed. It. But he wanted to study, like, what are the ones over the decades of time were able to continue to move forward and get ahead? Like, what made those organizations great? And he looked at the leaders, and he saw that there was one trait about those leaders. They're called level five leaders. It's a great book that made them better than all the rest. And there's great leaders that are level four leaders. They just don't stand this test of time. They have the ceiling. They can't get above the ceiling. And Stephen Covey uh, found out the one trait that connected them all. Can you guess what it was? Have you read the book? It's one that, as Christ followers, are like, yeah, this is a win. It was humility. Doesn't that just blow your mind? Like this business leader taking all these studies and these data, and he found that the leaders that were the best of the best of the best, that had the organizations that didn't plateau, but they kept going, were the ones that had this one trait that no other leader had. And that was humility. Do you find humility in the parable that Jesus spoke to about today? So this is what I want you to do. Because we want to be those who don't plateau who can enter any room. And that's the way we do that is to enter our heart first. Enter your heart first. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, literally. Literally. If you, heart, if you think about it, everybody touch their heart. Tap their heart. Is it on your left side or your right side? Don't tap your arm, your heart. 
Not too hard if you have a pacemaker. Tap your heart. Literally. So if you enter in your first, your heart, that means your posture is in a, in a place of seeing, right? If you have your heart uh, enters in a room first, your posture can see. If your head's down and your head enters first, maybe you're looking at your phone and you're checking your, you're scrolling Facebook, scrolling Twitch, whatever it is for you that day, you're not seeing things and noticing things. If you enter your heart first, you're literally able to see things and you have a posture that's ready to engage. And as Christ followers, we want to be people that God uses and engage. Symbolically, if we enter our heart first, what does a heart represent? It's on February 14th. You, I mean, love, love. A heart represents this love. So if we enter our heart first and we have love leading the way, that changes the way we see things, right? If we enter loving first, the tone that you use would be filtered through love. The agenda that you're coming with might change if you enter first with love, wanting to listen first, maybe, instead of talking first. Wanting to see what other people have to say and how they feel. And when we enter our heart first, and there's rooms that you enter in every day. We're going to be sending off people who are going to enter a room they've never been into before. How do we enter those rooms? Well, I encourage you, like Jesus chose, with humility, by entering with our heart first, literally and symbolically. And I want to go through this, this prayer of examine because I think if, if you're like me, you don't think about these things as you're in the room, as you go in. And it might just be because it's been a busy day and you're just going through the motions and you're not thinking and then later, in, later down the day or later in the time, you're like, oh, I should have thought about that or man. And there's this great saint in 16th century, 17th century named St. Ignatius Loyola who came up with this prayer of examine that, that would just say, hey, I notice that I enter into a lot of rooms and I'm going to reflect on those rooms I went in and I'm going to see where God was and what kind of things happened because if I was able to notice those, perhaps the next time I step into those rooms, I'll be ready or be able to see them better. And so I want to I invite you into this prayer that's been around for centuries that is still practiced today by the, mostly by a Jesuit tradition that we can use today to help us examine the rooms we've been in yesterday to see where God might have been and how God might want, what he might want to show us or want to, us to see, especially for the next time we go into a room. So I, I invite you would, you, would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And it, it's a simple prayer that takes, it has five things in, involved with it, and we're going to use our hand as a way to remind our bodies to what the prayer is, and I have these after if anybody wants them, but if you have your eyes closed and your heads bowed, the first thing that the prayer examine is the thumb, like a thumbs up. So put your thumb up just on your lap or next to you. It's what, and you ask the question, what have I to be grateful for yesterday? It's, it's meant for gratitude. If you just think about that for a second, what what did you maybe overlook or take for granted yesterday? But if it was lost or altered, it would have changed your whole day. Think about what added pleasure or enjoyment or excitement or fulfillment or understanding or peace to your life yesterday that you can be grateful for now. Was there anything unexpected that was a blessing yesterday? Now, if we move to the index finger, that's the next one, and it's, it's like pointing somewhere. So if you think of the idea of where, where, using your own words, where was God present in your day yesterday? Where might God have been present in your day yesterday? I'm going to say a prayer and give a moment of, for you to be thinking about that time yesterday and, and thinking where might God have been? Lord, let me be still and, and at peace just for a few moments in the busyness of my day. 
Let me be attentive to where I have been and where I am headed. And let me see where you have been in my life yesterday. Now if we move to the middle finger, it's the one finger that stands out above the rest. What stands out? If you you just touch, touch or tap your middle finger, looking back on the day, Is my attention drawn to anything I did or said or felt? What stood out? What brought you joy? What brought you sorrow? What stands out? Was there anything significant at the time that seems not as important now? Or vice versa, anything that wasn't significant, but now you look at it and it was really important. Did anything yesterday make you love more or hope more or increase your faith in other people, yourself or God? What stood out? Moving to your ring finger, and this is a a finger that resembles commitment. So if you have your finger, there's a ring finger, and you think, what? Do I ever think about the commitment I have to God to better myself? What commitments do you have to other people? Did you live up to those commitments? What are the ways, big and small, in which you live out your life as a network of relationships yesterday? Was there a time that you were better or worse towards those in your life? How did you treat those people close to you? Was there anything that you could do to, that you did yesterday or to strengthen or renew those relationships? Or is there anything you can do to strengthen or renew those relationships? Verse or number five, the finger, the the pinky finger. It's used for balance by musicians, artists rowers, holding a teacup. Is there anything that you said or did yesterday that's, or left unsaid or undid for which you were sorry? That's out of balance, that needs correcting? Is there anything in your life that's needing to be restored or adjusted? Anything that needs to be put right that you have power to do? What do you need to do today or say which will make those changes, big or small, to help you be the person God has called you to be. In Ephesians, Paul says, don't let your anger go down with the sun. God, we... We thank you for just an opportunity to reflect on our day yesterday that you gave. And we acknowledge that there's many rooms that we've been into, and maybe we didn't lead with our heart. Maybe we did, and we can celebrate, and we saw you there, and you showed showed up. But God, help us to understand, like, there's going to be other rooms that we're going to walk into. And every room we go in, God, we want to bring something with us. We want to bring your light into that room and help us to do that well. And you're so good to us, God, that you give us practical advice on what it looks like to just keep from being embarrassed or to get ahead. And I know the spirit of it is, is a spirit of humility, God. So as we enter the, the, the rooms later this day, this week, this month, it help us, it remind us to lead in humility, put our heart first, literally and symbolically. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. These are just little leaflets. If you'd like to take one, I'll, I'll leave them up on the altar that kind of goes through the exact same thing I went through. And this is a tradition. This is something that's been done for hundreds of years. 
uh, the prayer of examine. And it could take five, ten minutes, or perhaps 30 to 45 minutes. Depends on how much is on your mind or heart. Um, but now we know that in our church body, there's lots of people that are going into rooms, um, and we always want to send you and bless you as you go. And I even think about Charles Weatherby, who's not here. He's part of our board. He's actually um, at a gun club that uh, many, many years ago, a pastor who was reading the same Bible that I was reading um, was telling uh, people to, to go and be in the mission field. And one of the places he went and saw the mission field was the community he had in the gun club. And that's his way of bringing light. And so we just send and bless Charles to be a light in that room and lead with humility. But today we also get a chance to uh, bless and send people who are going off in other places. So I want to invite Gene Muma to come forward. Where you at, Gene? And as he does that, can we appreciate Gene today? get it figured out. Thank you, Pastor Caleb, for that good word. You know, when people come and join our congregation and become a part of it, it's always a happy occasion. We like that. But then when people leave, um, it's kind of mixed emotions. Um, now we're sad that they're going, and we're also happy for the next stage in their life. And we've known for two or three weeks that Ali Rudolph is going to be going to Nepal, and we've talked about that ministry. And also, a couple is, are leaving. Uh, Dave and Claudia Dewey are going on a new adventure in their life to Tennessee. So I'd like to ask Ali to come forward. Dave and Claudia, come down here. I want to talk to both of you for just a minute and hear just a little bit on what's going on. So, Allie, you're here. Um, you're going to Nepal. When are you leaving? September 9th. Right there. And why did, how, how are you getting there? What is your... Flying. Okay. <laughs> so Slowly. you're going to <laughs> Portland, and then what's the itinerary? What? Okay, Portland to Seattle, and then to car and then to Kathmandu. And then you'll be in Kathmandu or out of the... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there and <laughs> other places. Okay. And there's a, a ministry, something there that you're going to join and be a part of, I assume. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you're not, but, but you're not going by yourself. Mm -mm, I'm not going by myself. You have others and some are here today. Yes. Let's, okay. Let's invite all the rest of of this team that's with Allie up here. Yeah. <laughs> now, Allie, is this the entire team? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Did Nina get up here? Okay. And there's a, somebody who's a director. Are, are you part of the directing team? Yeah, so Gage and I are the leaders of this team. And, oh, good, at both ends, the, the, yeah. the foot and the head. Of, and you are leading this. Give just a rough idea. What will you be doing there? Um, we're going to be partnering with some of the ministries that are already there, um, distributing Bibles, doing door-to-door -door ministry, things like that, encouraging the local believers. Um, generation, working with anybody and everybody, so teaching English, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, you guys hang on for just a minute. I want to talk to Dave and Claudia. Um, you guys are leaving for Tennessee. Who's, who's the spokesman here? <laughs> they have a mic. She has a mic. There we go. Use the mic. <laughs> He's been hiding the mic. Come on, Dave. You won't see us again. It's okay. When are you leaving, Dave? Uh, we're leaving Wednesday. Leaving Wednesday? And, but you're not just going straight to Tennessee. No. Got, How are you going to get there? We've got family to visit in Medford, Klamath Falls, Boise Valley, uh, Grand Junction, and, and uh, Colorado Springs. Okay. And then they get to go to Tennessee. Yeah. 
why are you going to Tennessee? Because our daughter kept bugging us. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my health wasn't real good the first this year, and uh, she was worried about us. And you're, you have a place in her basement, yes, I think. Yes, she's got a got a large house and they're fixing up the basement for us to live in so she can watch over us by boss me around <laughs> <laughs> okay well we have um, some gifts for you um, that uh, just something to help you along the way so you don't get thirsty it's a little heavy you don't get yeah. hungry <laughs> you don't have to hold it the whole and, time <laughs> Yeah, it's a long you road might trip. Want to you set need that snacks down. and lots of breaks. And Allie, and for you and your whole group, we have a great big sack. I don't even know if I trust the handles, but, okay. but oh <laughs> I'll, t I'll take your mic. Okay. And um, there, anyway, there's some things in there that that you want to eat now, and you can maybe stick some into your carry-on and. And you know what you can smuggle into other countries with through all of that. But I, I think everything is legal. Uh, Pastor Caleb, um, just talk to us, and, and then let's pray for this group. Yeah, you guys are going in, across the country. Maybe you've been to another country before, and we're proud of you. I mean, we don't even know you that well. We just met a few of you, but we're just proud of you because you're representing who we represent, Jesus Christ. And this is inspires us. Hopefully, you know, I, I'm sure your families are proud. We just want you to know your faith family is excited for you and what God's going to be doing through you. And, and for Claudia and Dave, we're just, what a beautiful picture to have a family so sweet that you have established that they're willing to open up their home. That is something that's dear to me because it's so important. That's a witness to, to everyone's like how you've raised your kids and you've done good. And we're proud of you, and we're thankful. And Dollywood. There's lots of perks. Lots of perks. And we're just blessed that you've been part of our church family. And we know the next family, uh, faith family you're going to be, is going to be blessed as well. So we want to pray over you guys and what God's going to be doing. And you can join that with us if you just want to extend your hand forward and be in prayer over them as well as they go out and into new rooms um, uh, that God would be with them. So, God, we pray over this team uh, from YWAM, who's from all over the country, even here in our own midst that you've gathered and that you're sending, God. And we get to be part of that little story today by gifting them and praying over them, God, and you're so good. And we know you have, has, you've gone before them already. And there's going to be doors that are going to be open and some doors that are going to be hard to open and some doors that they think are going to be open that they're going to have to go around in a new place, God. And we pray you'd give them endurance and strength and perseverance, and a spirit of unity, and a spirit of peace. Uh, Lord, we, we pray for your, your spirit to guide them, to make wise choices for Gage and for Allie to lead this team well. And God, for Claudia and Dave Dewey, thank you for the relationship they have with their children. How sweet it is to come full circle in a way that it's healthy, God. Thank you for being the foundation that they built on their, their, their family and that it is holding up. The waves have hit, and it's holding up, and it is, the fruit is being eaten just because of this new journey and new season. So we pray blessing and your favor on them. May they enjoy it. Uh, may their grandkids see and, and hear the great wisdom that they have, and they to be able to pass that down, Lord. And we pray these things in all your name, Jesus. Amen.